glad you guys are here tonight. And uh, a couple of announcements that we have. Uh, annual trunk or treat will be on the 25th that's a, of October. That's a Sunday uh, at 5 p.m. out here in the front. And uh, you can dress up or not dress up or whatever you choose to do. And uh, hopefully we can have a bunch of kids there and uh, uh, have a good time. If you need some more information, we'll talk to Nick uh, or Megan, I guess. Uh, <coughs> Vanessa and George Biken have moved to their permanent room, which is 214. They were in 109. I do not have the address. Same as in the directory. But okay. it just, they just had a temporary room, so that's their new room. Okay. Uh, so if you, can look, in, the, if you can look in the directory, you can get the mailing address. Uh, those who are sick, uh, Melanie and John Loveless's daughter and son-in-law both have COVID, and I have not had any information as far as, uh, I know he evidently has a bad, or pretty good case because he's in the hospital, but uh, I haven't heard any more about him. Uh, did get some good news this afternoon, the Carpenter family. the COVID test and they came back negative and so uh, the concern was that both Debbie and Scott had upper, upper respiratory problems and so uh, but it was it's not COVID so that's good news. Uh, Nick Schroeder also had uh, COVID test and he is negative as well so that's good news. Uh, Lonnie and Linda, we want to remember them. I guess she's got one more treatment. No, she had her last radiation Monday. Monday. Okay. And uh, Diane and Craig Rabb and uh, from what Mary was telling me, well, uh, he is not doing well at all. They're going to do an MRI to see how far the tumor has gone, and then from that we'll be able to determine how much longer he has to live. And so... Uh, I guess within the next few days or weeks we will know that. But we sure want to keep them in our prayers. Diane and Craig both. That's all the announcements I have. Does anybody have anything? I do. Yes, ma'am.
that they will be able to get over that soon. And for uh, Melanie's uh, boyfriend, we pray that uh, that you will uh, comfort him, that you will give him uh, peace, and that also that you it will be your will that he can uh, become well with this. Father, we thank you for this family. We thank you for um, the fact that you have kept us safe as a group of people. Uh, we thank you for all the many blessings that we have in you. And we thank you so much for Jesus. In his name, amen. Amen.
scientific mind because he is a scientist. So, well, science does not uh, mean there is no God. It actually shows that there is a creator. And then, as he was studying the Bible, to find the evidence to disprove God, I probably looked in uh, Genesis where it lists the order of how life came in uh, in its succession up to humans. And it's the same as science, atheistic science, says it happened. They're in agreement on that. It's the same, same order. So he had an open mind. A scientist, he looked at the facts and said, "Okay, that's that's evidence." And in this uh, this particular uh, book of uh, that John Clayton has, there are two articles that I thought were really interesting about the evidence of God in His creation. And <laughs> believe it or not, one is how fish drink water and how sea animals drink water. I got to read this. This got to be interesting. I'm going to read this because he explains it a lot more easily than I could trying to explain it in my own words. All living things necessarily have some salt water content in their bodies to keep chemical balance, allowing life to exist. The fluids inside an ocean-dwelling fish are only about a third as salty as the ocean itself. The water inside the fish's body tends to leave by osmotic pressure, which is the tendency of fluids to move through membranes toward higher concentrations. To avoid this loss of, of water, the fish does simply open its mouth and drink seawater, but that brings large amounts of salt into the fish's body. The salt concentration would be there, uh, would be more than the fish's kidneys could handle. To aid the kidneys, the gills of the ocean fish are designed to expel salt, so the fish is not pickled by it. In freshwater fish, the osmotic pressure is reversed, so the fluids inside the fish are saltier than the water outside. The skin of a freshwater fish is designed so that water seeps in through the skin and gills. Now, therefore, the fish does not have to drink at all. When a salmon leaves the ocean and enters the freshwater stream, it merely stops drinking water. Like freshwater fish, it depends on its skin to bring in its water needs. God's design of life includes fitting live living things with specialized equipment to survive in every, uh, in every environment. Fish are remarkable creatures, especially equipped for the water world in which they live. I never thought this about the albatross. It's a, fit, a, a, it's a bird that lives out over the water for up to a year. It's flying around over the ocean. Where does it get its water from? Well, it gets it from the ocean. They need to drink water just like every other animal does. Whales and seals also do not have land-based water supplies, and yet like all mammals, they need water to survive. So how do sea animals drink water when ocean water is salty? God's design of living creatures always includes unusual equipment to enable them to deal with their environment. In the case of seabirds, like the uh, albatross, uh, they have a set of salt glands in their heads that connect to the bird's nostrils. The birds drink seawater, but the glands are so efficient that within three hours, all of the salt is removed through the nostrils. Whales and other aquatic mammals produce urine that has extremely concentrated salt content. 
by allowing high salt concentrations in the urine to diffuse into the ocean, the salt never reaches toxic levels inside the animal. An interesting sidelight to this is that the milk of these sea mammals is very low in water content. In that way, they conserve water. Milk from seals is only half the water content of lean hamburger. Everywhere we look in the natural world, we see that a wonder-working hand has gone before. These marvelous designs are not the product of mindless chance. They slow in intelligence. They show an intelligence who created and uh, with purpose and wisdom. We read in Romans chapter one, uh, verses eighteen to twenty. We, um, oh, let me read that. The wrath of God, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since that may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave him thanks. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. It's it's too bad that, you know, like they say, common sense isn't common anymore. You, you see some crazy things going on today, and they, what are they thinking? But when we see the power of God, Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We see evidence of God, evidence of design everywhere we look. I don't know if you around here it's kind of hard to see the stars at night because there's so many lights around. Ben and I used to go up to uh, Yosemite Valley uh, every chance we got in the winter. And uh, on a moonless night, we'd go out in the, the meadows, and they had benches, just half log kind of benches. And we'd lay down on the benches looking up head to head just so we could talk, and we'd just watch. And the sky just, just a black sky with all those millions and billions twinkling things up there, and occasionally a, a meteorite would go by, just extra entertainment. And it was just awesome to look up that and wonder, what is all that for up there? If nothing but just our enjoyment, it's, it's an enjoyment for us. It was great. We had to bundle up because it was very cold out there in the winter. We tried to the snow together snow off of the log run. And we do that every time we're up there because they're just so beautiful. So God shows us his creation. And I hope that we as Christians don't fall into this, this kind of a, I guess it's kind of a human trait to have an opinion and then try to find the facts to back it up rather than looking at the other way. And if the world could do that, it would be a much better place. But God shows his evidence. That there is a God is, is no doubt. There's, there's no way to realistically believe that there could be no God. Or even, even 
doubt that there is a creator of some sort. So, the main part of the lesson is let's not be like so much of the world is, making our decisions by what we want to believe instead of what the evidence believes and when it comes to the Bible. is It's a very old book. And people have been trying to disprove it scientifically and any other way and they have never succeeded. If it's lasted that long, if everybody over these thousands of years, then it has to be true. Thank you very much for your attention. See you. Amen. Father, as we come to you at this time, Father, we're truly thankful for the freedom we have in this land in which we live, that we can come together to worship you. Father, we're truly thankful for the many blessings of life you have blessed us with, watching over and caring for us as we go through our daily walks of life. Father, we pray that you be with those who are unable to be with us, you watch over and care for them, and it's your will that they be restored to their good health and take me back with us once again. Father, pray that you be with Linda and Tonight. Lonnie, as they go through this phase of life, and they always look to you for guidance, and we pray that it is your will that let them be healed of her cancer, and that she'll be able to have, have the opportunity to return and be back with us once again. Father, we pray for this nation of ours. It certainly needs your help, because it's heading down the wrong pathway of life. If, you, if it is your will, let it be turned around and it can be a God-fearing nation once again. If it is your will, we know it will be done, because it, you are the King of kings and the Lord of creator of all things. Pray that you be with those who teach your word wherever they may be throughout this world of yours, that they do so in a way that's pleasing to you and uplifting to those who will take time to listen and to learn the right steps in life to take before it's too late to enter into your form. Go with us, watch over and care for us, and guide us safely, for we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. bit too ambitious tonight and thinking that I would get it covered and I, I know that that's not going to happen um, so we'll obviously make this a two lesson or, yeah two lesson chapter uh, I'm going to do this chapter a little bit different from the other ones partly because of the way the, inf the information that is uh, in the, the chapter is arranged let me just remind us that in 1 Samuel we uh, saw in the 13th chapter that, that uh, Israel is on the verge of war with the Philistines. Uh, the thing that precipitated the, the battle that we get into in chapter 14 is that Jonathan has uh, struck the garrison at uh, Gibeah. Uh, and that has incited the battle that, that unfolds. While uh, that was happening... Uh, Saul uh, musters the, the uh, army and uh, they agree to meet with Samuel and at the uh, appointed time when Samuel's not there, when Saul thought that he should be there, he takes it upon himself to authorize the offering up uh, on the altar and for that reason, when Samuel ar arrives, as soon as he finishes it, Samuel tells him that the, the monarchy will end with him uh, as far as that dynasty is concerned, his, his crown will not pass to his sons. That brings us then to where we are tonight as we're taking a look at this. And, and I was thinking about the fact this afternoon that, that uh, as we'll see in this chapter, Saul was engaged in battle with enemies of Israel throughout his reign. Uh, but there are really only a handful of battles that Saul fought that are, are in our text, set-piece battles. And every one of them that are in there, 
are in there not just so that we can know that Saul won a victory, but so that we can see something about the work of God and also something about the character and the nature of Saul. And what we began seeing last week comes forward through uh, this 14th chapter. Saul's devotion to God is one of convenience, in my opinion. To the extent that, that uh, God's will lined up with his will, uh, Saul could be a, a fairly religious person. To the extent that it didn't, Saul didn't have a lot of use for it. And I know that's not human nature today, so you just have to imagine what that would have been like. We begin in chapter 14, verse 1. Now the day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was up for this first section right here, there are five things I want you to notice in what we just looked at. First of all, God is about to give Israel a great victory. It's going to involve two men and two men only. Everything else that you're going to read about that takes place after that is going to be a mop-up operation. The victory belongs to God, and the way that he does it is, is a, a way that cannot be explained away uh, by human military strategy on, on any level, but it doesn't take anything away from the faith and the bravery and the confidence of Jonathan. And so uh, those two men, Jonathan and his armor bearer, will be the human elements by which his victory is achieved. Saul is unaware of Jonathan's plan. The, uh, the text makes that clear, and that's really sort of setting the stage. When you read passages that, that, that bring up things like that, and, and you think, well, why do we need to know that? Usually there's something coming along a little later on that uh, that information will help explain, and that's what we'll see as we get towards the end of the chapter. <coughs> Saul has about 600 men with him. We noted last week that uh, uh, his numbers are depleting every day. Jews are not uh, coming to, to, to the call of arms to begin with. They're hiding in the caves and in the hills. Uh, others have crossed the Jordan River and gone over to the eastern side. We'll find that there are others who have decided that uh, uh, if you can't beat them, join them. And that's exactly what they have done. They have joined the ranks of the Philistines. That will not turn out to be a good strategy for the Philistines in the end. Ahijah is the great-grandson of Eli, the high priest, and he is uh, with Saul in the camp. Ahijah probably is another name for Abimelech, although it's possible that when you factor in the ages and, and uh, put everything together as far as Saul's reign, uh, it's possible that Ahijah... Uh, would have had a brother by the name of Abimelech that uh, would succeed him, but uh, I, th I think that kind of strains the information that we have in the text. So probably Ahijah and Abimelech are, are the one and the same guy, uh, and Abimelech is going to be the one who will eventually be put to death by Saul, uh, along with the other priest at Nob, but that's a little further down the road. The soldiers, we're told, are also unaware of uh, uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer's plan. Um, one other thing that I didn't put on the screen, and that is that it makes mention of the fact that Ahijah is there and that he ha is there with the ephod. The ephod is a, a part of the garments of the high priest. Not every priest had an ephod. Uh, and the ephod is one of the ways by which God communicates. And so you need to have that little bit of information with you because there's going to be some communication and some efforts to communicate uh, with God uh, as we go through this chapter. Verse 4, between the passes by which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistine garrison, there was a sharp crag on the one side and a sharp crag on the other side, and the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sina. The crag, uh, the crag rose on the north opposite Michmash, and the other on the south opposite Geba. Let me stop right there. Um, if geography is your thing, you know, one of the neatest tools that we have these days is Google Earth. You can get on Google Earth and you can drill down and, 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 and see vehicles and things of that nature. And so I spend a lot of time trying to, to pinpoint exactly where this is. And the problem is, is that we don't know where some of these places are. Names have changed down through the centuries. And uh, some of these things are lost until the, 
uh, the Lord lets another archaeologist come up with another find and confirm something. Um, but names change, and so it's uh, there. There is a mishmash today in Israel. You can look at it. You can see the wadi that runs east and west in front of it. Uh, I saw several places that could uh, uh, be what we're looking at here, but uh, you know nothing's marked. And, and uh, Israel is one of those places. You know, on Google Earth, you can click the little man icon and put you at street level, and you can see what you would see if you were on the street. Um, <laughs> but in Israel, they don't let you do that uh, in very many places. And uh, this wadi uh, doesn't have any roads going through it, so uh, kind of hard to figure out where this is. But if you go home and do that, what I've just described, or just on your map, click the satellite view, um, you'll see the same thing. This is some rugged, rugged terrain, and it's evident that some of these these uh, uprisings in the ground are just very sharp and, and severe. Uh, and these wadis have these little branches that come into them. The valley floor, which is what the wadi is, seems to be uh, the place to travel. And the high ground is held either by Saul and his 600 or by the Philistines, uh, and the massive army that they had. So with that back to the text, verse 6 says, Then Jonathan said to the young man <clears throat> who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. The armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, turn yourself, and I and here am I with you according to your desire. Well, there are a lot of passages in the New Text in the in the Old Testament, I should say, that has some real uh, inspiring thoughts for us. And, and I think this is one of the great uh, texts of the Old Testament. Uh, Let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. The Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. There is a clear distinction made in the text, as I said last week, or the week before we had seen last week. Um, the spirit of Jonathan is completely different from the spirit of Saul, the longer that Saul is uh, on the throne. Uh, Jonathan seems to be a man of integrity, seems to be a man who has strong convictions about God and faith in God. And unfortunately, because of the disobedience of his father, what could have been is aborted. It's stillborn. We'll never know what Jonathan could have done because of the sins that uh, his father committed that forfeits his right or you know, the, the future for him to potentially be a king. So it's not going to work out. But clearly, um, the sins of uh, the individual, as God says to the prophet Ezekiel, are the things that God judges us for. And uh, Saul's going to be held accountable for Saul's conduct. Jonathan isn't like father, like son. He seems to have a heart for God. And uh, we see that here. When he says that the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few, um, I don't know what he had in mind by that uh, as far as who the, the many are concerned. But if he's thinking about the Israelite army, uh, there's no many in the Israelite army. Uh, there's 600 men, and, and the numbers are dropping all along the way. So um, it seems to me that Jonathan is, is saying, uh, if the Lord intends to uh, deliver the Philistines into our hands, <laughs> whether it's 600 or armor bearer, just me and you, the Lord can take care of it. Let's go get them. And that's what he's going to do. I just, I'm amazed and impressed with his desire and with his heart for God. Uh, the armor bearer said to him, Do all in your heart, turn yourself, and I am with you according to your desire. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given him into our hands, and this shall be the sign to us. So Jonathan's strategy is, we're going to come down, we're going to get down to the valley floor, then we're going to expose ourselves where their lookouts can see us. The Philistine army is not uh, two or three million people massed right there on the edge of the cliff, and everybody's looking over and everybody sees this. Uh, 
common military strategy then and today well is that you, you know the main base is somewhere removed from the battle site close enough to to move troops around but far enough back to keep from being being blindsided what we have on the on the edge here are philistines who have sentry duty lookout duty uh, <coughs> excuse me so you've got a garrison of guys on sentry duty and that's who uh, Jonathan uh, intends to to uh, engage in this battle so we're going to slip down there and uh, we're going to let ourselves be seen if they come after us that will demonstrate some bravery on their part because after all they don't know if it's us and the rest are in hiding or if it's us and that's all there is will they be brave enough to come down to us or will they say hey come up here we want to talk to you and he says, if that's the, the route that they make or the choice that they make, then we'll know that that's a sign that God has given us that he is going to be with us. Uh, there is nothing in the text to explain why Jonathan says, here's the sign and, and that God is going to go cooperate with him on his sign. But I would say this, Jonathan is a man of faith. He's not making a sign for personal gain or, or for personal betterment in any way. He just believes that God is going to keep the promises that he made. You know, one of you will put 10,000 to flight if you have faith, if you're obedient. And he's just saying, God, I'm going to commit on faith to what you said to do, and you'll let me know if you're going to be a part of it or not. So, again, I think you have to admire Jonathan. Uh, verse 11, when both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, Behold, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. So the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will tell you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer put some to death after him. <clears throat> the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within half a furrow in an acre of land. All right. First of all, what Jonathan said would be the sign that God is going to give them a victory here comes about. And so he says, you follow me. And so they're going up single file, scaling up the side of this cliff. Um, <clears throat> the, the sentry guys up on top, they don't know if there's somebody come along after them or not. Um, perhaps, as we'll see a little bit later on, so many Israelites have been defecting over to Philistines, perhaps they think these two guys will come up and, and uh, surrender themselves as, as well. And so uh, come up here, we want to talk to you doesn't prove to be a good strategy for them. It says that uh, Jonathan killed some and that the armor bearer came along behind him and killed some more. And the first slaughter, uh, about 20 men uh, within about a half a fur in an acre of land. What in the world is that saying? It appears that the furrow is is talking about what two oxen yoked together can do, um, either in a morning or, or in a day. It's hard for, to say, and it's hard for the guys who try to interpret this stuff to come up with an exact understanding of, of what it means. But, uh, you know, if, it's, if that's the rate of, of what a, a, a team of, of oxen can plow at, then, uh, they only got about a half an acre's worth. So I got to thinking about that. That would mean that from my mailbox to about the edge of my back patio, there'd be 20 guys dead. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty graphic way of describing just how effective uh, Jonathan's faith was and his armor bearer. All right, and that's not all. And there was a trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, even the garrison and the raiders trembled, and the earthquake so that it became a great trembling. 
Now Saul's watchmen in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, a multitude melted away, and they went here and there. So uh, the faith of Jonathan and his armor bearer, they trust in God. They do their part. Um, it is God who is giving this victory. He is the one that's putting this, this spirit of fear in the, the hearts of the Philistines. And they go into panic mode. And the text says, they're going hither, thither, and yon. They're just, it's chaos. Uh, Saul has his sentries looking on their high parts, and they're looking at, and, and they're seeing not just the sentries leaving, they're seeing the whole Philistine camp is, is decamping, melting away. And uh, Saul is going to reach a conclusion as to what that means. So Saul said to the people who were with him, Number now and see who has gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty graphic uh, uh, illustration, I would think. If I was Saul, what would that make me think about Jonathan and, and about his commitment and about God? Well, what he says is, he says to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here, for the ark of God was at that time with the sons of Israel. While Saul talked to the priest, the commotion in the camp of the Philistines continued and increased, so Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Now it says here that the ark of God was at that time with the sons of Israel, and it was. At a place called kiriath Jerim, which is not where Saul is, not where his 600 men are, and not where uh, Ahijah is. The writer just simply saying that Saul says, I want you to go send for the ark. Which seems to me to be sort of a foolish tactic. Uh, how long is it going to take for them to go get it and, and bring it here? Uh, they don't need the ark for him to communicate with God because he's got the high priest and the priest has the ephod. Um, I'm not really sure what Saul was thinking here, but uh, if I can be judgmental as I sometimes am prone to be, I have an idea that Saul was more interested in the appearance of religion than in himself being a spiritual man. I, I'm thinking, he's thinking how good it would look if the king and his army is going in procession with the Ark of the Covenant in place. and, and uh, but the enemy's getting away. And so then, like all of a sudden, it's a hijack's fault. He says, you guys get out of the way. <laughs> we got a battle to fight. <laughs> and they've got one sword, remember, because Jonathan has the other one. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was very great confusion. Where the sword that was against his fellow was not Hebrew swords or Israelite swords. They don't have any. These are the Philistines who, in their panic and terror, have turned on each other. And uh, now there's plenty of armament to pick up as, as they go along. Verse 21, now the Hebrews who were with the Philistines previously who went up with them all around the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. So here's a, a, a group of, of Israelites who had reached the conclusion the best thing to do is just get on the side of the Philistines now when they deal out retribution, maybe we won't get too rough of treatment. Uh, but when they see that Israel has the upper hand, uh, they basically become fifth columnists within the Philistine army, and, and that's not good. And if they were actually uh, employed by the army, they may have had weapons themselves. All right, verse 22 when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines had fled, even they also pursued them closely in the battle. So the Lord delivered Israel that day, and the battle spread beyond beth -Avid. All right, so Saul's got 600 men. 598 of them are chasing after Jonathan and his armor bearer. And chasing after the Philistines who were killing themselves and trying to get away as quickly as they can get away. And in the pandemonium, the Hebrews that are with the Philistines, uh, they change sides real quick. And those who had gone into hiding in the hill country, they come out and we've got the Philistines on the run. But notice that the text is very clear to let us know Israel didn't have much to do with this. 
the Lord gave them that victory. Their job is going to be mop up and they're going to blow that because of Saul. Now it says the battle spread beyond Beth Avon. I was talking to you a while ago about the fact that a lot of these places, we're not really sure where they are. We know where Michmash is, and we know where Beth Avon is, and we know that Saul is camped somewhere east of Michmash between there and Beth Avon, but the Philistines are going west, and Beth Avon is east of where Saul's army is. So I think what we're finding out is the Philistines are saying it's every man for himself, and, and they're not too worried about, you know, where's the interstate and the, the west exit here. They're just... They're just heading for the hills, wherever that might take them. And so uh, this, this uh, disintegration of the Philistine army is going everywhere. Verse 24, now the men of Israel were hard pressed on that day. For Saul had put the people under oath saying, cursed be the man who eats food before evening. And until I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. All of the people of the land entered the forest, and there was honey on the ground. When the people entered the forest, behold, there was a flow of honey, but no man put his hand to his mouth when the people feared the oath. Now, what do you think about Saul's strategy here? Putting his men under oath. You can't eat until what? Well, what does it say? You can't eat before evening and until I have avenged myself on my enemies. Did you get those pronouns? And where is the Lord in all of that? That's what I'm getting at. You can see this character of Saul. He's um, Some think that this battle may have happened in about the 20th year or so of his reign. Uh, he may by this time be a little full of himself. <laughs> but uh, he doesn't have a heart for God in all this. And now he's going to drive his men to the point of exhaustion and beyond because he wants to settle a score as though this was his problem. And uh, it's not going to work out. All right, verse 27, but Jonathan had not heard when his father put the people under the oath. Therefore, he put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly put the people under oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food today. And the people were weary. Then Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. See now how my eyes have brightened because I tasted a little of his honey. How much more if only the people had eaten freely today and the spoil of their enemies, which they found, for now the slaughter among the Philistines has not been great. Understand that when this battle was over, the soldiers did not run to the nearest parking lot, get in however many pickup trucks they needed to get from there back to Philistia. Everything is being done on foot. And a massive army has been assembled. So it's not just that you've got to get away, but you've also got to get away with all of your food supplies. You've got to get away with all of your slaves. You've got to get away with, with all of uh, your arsenal that you have stockpiled. And you can't leave any of that behind, if, if, uh, if at all possible, to uh, give your enemy an opportunity. So the Philistines, while they are melting away, we're not talking about flying Mach 1 from where they are to home base. Okay? They've got to navigate the same uh, hill country that the Israelites navigate, only it's not their home turf. What I'm, what I'm saying is there was some time for Israel to replenish, you know, have a meal, and that's the point that Jonathan's making. If, if, if we were all fresh, how much more could we do? Uh, my father made a bad call here, and, uh, and he did. All right, verse 31, they struck among the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aijalon, and the people were very weary. The people rushed greedily upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. Well, we know from the law that's a no-no, okay? Uh, then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood, and he said, You... 
have acted treacherously. Uh, hello, pot, right? You have acted treacherously. Roll a great stone to me today. Well, what does he mean by roll a great stone to me today? Huh? Come set up court. What is anybody else? I think what we're hearing here is that that, that uh, you have acted treacherously, and I'm going to solve this. Uh, we're going to slaughter. Give me a big stone. We're going to slaughter the livestock on the stone. The blood can drain off the way it's supposed to, and you know I'm going to take care of this problem. Well. Saul hasn't been very good at taking care of obedience problems all along, uh, but that's his strategy here. So Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, each one of you, bring me his ox or his sheep and slaughter to hear and eat, and do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. Now remember, a lot of these people have been hiding in the hill country, in the caves, and they haven't had a lot to eat before this day. Uh, so you can imagine some very hungry, ravenous people taking a situation into their own hand. But, but what started this sin on the part of the people? A king saying, you don't get thee till I say so. But you got to fight anyway. And so if, if there's a, a cause for the sin that they've committed... Uh, all Saul has to do is look in the mirror, but that's not really the way he does things. So all the people that night brought each one his ox with him and slaughtered it there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. If he has been king for as long as, as uh, some scholars think, and this is the first altar that he built... Um, how much devotion to God is there in this man? Kind of a kind of a disturbing uh, bit of information. Then Saul said, "Let us go down uh, after the Philistines by night, and take spoil upon them until the morning light. And let us not leave a man of them." And they said, "Do whatever seems good to you." So the priest said, "Wait a minute. That's not in the Hebrew. That's that's." Uh, they said, the "Priest said, let us draw near to God here." Saul inquired of God. Now, he doesn't have the ark, so how's he going to inquire of God? He's got the ephod. So Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him on that day. Saul said, Draw near. Uh, hear all you chiefs of the people and investigate and see how the sin has happened today. For as the Lord lives who delivers Israel... Though it is in Jonathan, my son, <clears throat> he shall surely die. But not one of all the people what answered him. Now, at this point, Saul doesn't suspect Jonathan. Uh, what Saul is doing is saying, well, if God's not answering this, somebody has messed up, and I'm going to figure out who it is, and I don't care who it is. He can be the youngest private in the army. He can be my son. If you have messed up, if you have broken God's law, you're going to die. That's coming from Saul. That's, uh, uh, that's a little rich, is it not? Well, we'll end it there. That's the word I get to. We'll end it there, verse 40. So I think the rest of the... the uh, things that we're going to see in Paul and Saul's character from this day going forward, it just goes downhill. Chapter 15 is going to be the battle with the Amalekites, and you know what happens there. And, and uh, um, I think what this is telling us, guys, is, is we cannot be ambiguous in our relationship with God. We can't be for the sake of appearances and for the sake of propriety God's men and women today because we're all here and then be some something totally different the rest of the time. You, God did not make your spirit to work that way. You cannot wear two hats. You're going to go in one direction. You're going to have uh, hypocrisy 
and I think that's what we're going to see here, but the real spirit of Saul is going further and further away from God, and that's a tragic thing because the spirit of God was on him at one time, but he lost, he lost his commitment. Any questions? Let's close with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for the day that you've given to us. We're thankful for the opportunity that you have afforded us to be here. We know, Father, that many are not uh, able to be with us today. Uh, sickness and, and health concerns are holding them away. And We pray, Father, that uh, you would remove those things, if it be your will, to let them be back with us. We ask, Father, that uh, you would continue to be with this nation, and we acknowledge that we would not be who we are without you. And we ask, Father, that uh, our leaders throughout this nation would recognize that and, and have a heart for you again. We ask that you would watch over us and give us journey, a safe journey home and a good night's rest in Christ. Then we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.